Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, well, this is this was really a surprise. Um, I, I honestly didn't know about this um, course and this forum, and so I'm really honored to be invited here. Uh, I'm not going to uh, present my. I'm not going to present my research um, today, but well, due to some like scheduling issues, yeah. uh, it was really. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. So, um, but my my original uh, my dissertation was in development economics, which is essentially economics of uh, poor countries. And I, over time, I transitioned into like those issues in the U.S. And surprisingly, I mean, surprisingly for me, initially not anymore. Uh, some of the issues that I dealt with in developing countries in terms of access to healthcare and education are unfortunately equally true in uh, a much, much richer country like the U.S. So in a way, this lecture uh, perfectly uh, fits into my overall research agenda, which is essentially how to um, lift people out of both low level of income, low level of healthcare access, and so forth. Okay, so let's start without much uh, ado. So, uh, one quick note: um, I know it's always a struggle. It's I can't even see all of you on the screen as I'm speaking. Um, this is one downside of the Zoom sessions. Um, interaction can also be a bit tricky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop at a couple of junctures, uh, like 15 or 20 minutes apart uh, to take your questions. You can leave your questions in comments too. Um, I'll try to um, like do simultaneously, like read the comments and answer, or you can, you can ask your questions um, live uh, when I stop for questions, right? Okay. So what the background of this uh, lecture is what I would like to call spatial poverty. Now we know that throughout history, uh, various units of geographic areas, it could be countries, it could be states within countries, um, it could be like areas like provinces or counties within states, uh, definitely cities within like broader geographic areas and even neighborhoods within cities. Um, they differ in not only income, but also many other health and education outcomes significantly. For instance, if you take like a subway um, or a train from one end of one, one big city like New York City to the other end, you can see, you can pass areas uh, where you have like very rich neighborhoods with like very high health outcomes and high life expectancy and lower income and low life expectancy, even though they live sometimes like blocks apart, okay? I, I'm, I'm guessing many of you are, even if you are not in different countries, but you, you kind of are familiar with realities of different countries. And I'm sure you can think of your own city or your own area, and you can think of this kind of uh, differences in income and access across different geographical uh, regions. So, Maps are a wonderful way to um, eyeball this kind of um, differences and inequality. So this is, um, I've tried to leave all the um, sources in, in uh, notes so you can access them later. So this is like a world inequality uh, map and you can see easily like there are high income countries like North America and there are low income countries concentrated in uh, large chunks of Africa, then there are like uh, lower middle income country like India. Um, let me see if I can change my pointer option. Yeah, so you can see India is a uh, low middle income country, so forth, okay? And you can draw a similar map for New York City. Uh, I've been living in New York City for almost like 19 years now. Um, but as I said, like you can, if you live in a big city in this world, you can possibly find a map like this in your own city. And you can see that um, there's enormous amount of diversity in income within uh, one city. Uh, if you're not familiar, and this will come up 
in a couple of slides again, if you're not familiar with New York City, so this part, this chunk is Manhattan. This is like the Manhattan Island. Okay, and this part is like the downtown Manhattan where, well, most of the movies and TV shows have been shot or at least based in. So this is clearly, you can see that this is a wealthy part of New York City. This is, this chunk is Central Park and this is Upper West Side and this is like Fifth Avenue where uh, our ex-president used to live. Uh, so these are all wealthy neighborhoods. And then as, as you further go up, you get lower and lower income neighborhoods. And this across Harlem River, you have uh, the borough of Bronx, which is one of the most impoverished areas uh, in New York City. Okay, so just keep in mind because I'll I'll come back to this um, in a couple of slides. Okay, now it's one thing to live in a low-income area, but what worries social scientists, economists, sociologists, anthropologists, social scientists uh, more is the intergenerational immobility. Okay, so sometimes we call in development literature, we call it poverty trap or vicious circle of poverty. So why is it a trap? It's trapped because when you are kind of stuck in it, when you are inside it, you are stuck and it's very difficult to get out of it. Okay, so hence the name trap. So a vicious circle of poverty would be in, a con in the context of a regional area would be this, like you are born in a poor area, you are deprived of opportunities, like you're the schools that uh, you go to are not very good. So you grew up to be poor and then you, you live in a low, what we call um, low opportunity area. So you, you kind of get stuck in that low opportunity area. And what is probably even worse is your children are also stuck in that low opportunity area and so on and so forth and their children too. So not only are, not only is your life affected uh, when you live in a low income area, but potentially your children and their children. So generationally, you can be stuck in poverty. Okay. And that's something people are worried even more than like the absolute sense of poverty. Okay. So this is New York City in 1990. And in this map, I mean, I picked up from two different sources. So a color scheme is different. I'm sorry about that. But you, again, if you remember, so this is the downtown and Upper West Side, Upper East Side, like the Central Park here. So you can see that even in 1990, downtown and up, Upper West Side and Upper East Side and Central Park area, those were wealthy neighborhood, okay? So like in 25 years, the sort of the spatial inequality did not really change in New York City. Now, this intergenerational um, lack of opportunities persists through several pathways. Um, some of them, some I have list, listed some of them, you can think of more. Uh, so for instance, one would be education for obvious reasons. Uh, second would be health. You, you grow up in a neighborhood which doesn't have access to there, there are studies, uh, there are several good studies on this, uh, the, what is called um, food desert or healthy food desert. So if you live in the Bronx, certain parts of the Bronx don't really have good supermarkets. So you don't have access to healthy food. Okay, Then crime is obviously one uh, reason people can get stuck in, in low poverty areas because sometimes they are afraid to go to school. Um, good teachers don't come in to teach to, in these neighborhoods because they are afraid. Uh, then there is like civil infrastructure like policing. Uh, there's a long literature on that too, how like uh, this kind of state apparatus um, prevents um, low, low income neighborhoods from uh, like flourishing. And then there's issues of social interaction. You, and there's again, again, there's long research on that. So I mean, you, you go to school in a high opportunity area and you get to meet other people who come from this like wealthier and higher opportunity families and through social interaction you you can like achieve high, like a higher level of um, education and income which wouldn't have been possible if you didn't go to 
if you're stuck in a neighborhood or area where you interact with other um, low income and low opportunity individuals. Okay, so these are these are kind of facts uh, that we at least economists we, we we usually do not pass what is called value judgment. We just look at these um, facts as they are, and as I said, like all these fields have their own line of research which shows that that some of these factors prevent um, low income areas to flourish and people who are stuck in low income areas remain so, okay? So one example would be from the same map that I was showing you from New York City. So this is, this map shows, by the way, New York City school, public school system is one of the most segregated, even though it, it has this reputation about being like progressive and liberal city, but Unfortunately, it's one of the most segregated school systems uh, in the country, in the US. Um, so you can take a quick look at, on the left-hand side, you have um, school rating. And so this is the neighborhood, this is, sorry, the borough I was talking about Bronx. So South Bronx and even some parts of North Bronx. So this is some of the impoverished uh, neighborhoods. And these are some of the low rated schools. So you can see how income and opportunity in terms of education um, go hand in hand. I have a recent paper where I, sh I use zip code level data um, on COVID infection and correlate with uh, some of the economic variables like how long people commute, um, how like in terms of housing, um, how overcrowded housing are. And there's a very, very strong relationship correlation between COVID infection rates and this is, I'm talking about April, May last year when like New York City was hit uh, really hard uh, by the pandemic. So there's a very strong correlation between income, COVID infection rate, and things like occupation, like people who work in essential work, proportion of people within a zip code who work in essential industries, proportion of people who live in a zip code where more than one person shared a room in an apartment, so these things are obviously correlated with, with COVID. And some of these geographical patterns were also uh, clear in, in, that, in that research. Okay, now these are all bad news. So let's discuss some of the like things that we do, economics do. Um, and a large part of this lecture would be uh, what kind of public policy can solve this problem? Okay, so before that, um, many of you may not, I mean, almost all of you probably have heard the term public policy, but you may not be familiar with what public policy uh, actually means. Public policy basically means um, government policies. It could be local government policy, like New York City government policy, it could be state policy, New York state policy, or it could be the federal government policies. Uh, you can think of all of this, you can think of education in, in like very easy terms, right? Like school district, local school district policies, New York state policies, and the Department of Education, uh, the Federal Department of Education policy to influence economic agents' behavior and change socioeconomic outcomes. Can everyone make sure that their microphones are turned off? Thank you so much. So sorry. Uh, well, uh, it's all right. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with this kind of uh, hiccups. Anyway, so education policy would be rezoning. Health policy would be the federal government. Health policy would be food stamp. Where so okay. So, so the second part, um, second part of bullet points. Basically, I want to show that public policy can be like encouraging, like a carrot, like food stamp that you in, government in, make sure that you don't go hungry, and it can be stick where you have like tobacco taxes, where the government doesn't really want you to smoke, okay? Uh, similarly, housing policy, housing vouchers as something uh, is something we are going to discuss uh, later uh, in a couple of slides. Um, housing vouchers try to uh, encourage people to like move to different places or have houses uh, at different places, whereas property taxes try to sort of uh, make sure that if, if you're wealthy, you 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 have to pay higher property taxes. Um, so you have to pay your due. 
All right, so now let me take some questions. Okay, as I said, I, um, I cannot um, answer all, all the questions. So uh, let, me, let me touch upon a couple of um, questions on health issues. Um, so crime, so first of all, um, both physical and mental health. Um, so in, I'll talk a little bit about my research. So what I've shown in my research is um, discrimination in healthcare. So by discrimination, I mean, uh, so people are asked survey questions like when you visited a healthcare facility last year, did you feel that you are treated differently from others due to uh, mostly uh, race, ethnicity, but also for like age, body weight, um, sexual orientation, so on and so forth. And by and large, I've, so I've used both national like federal data and New York City data. And by and large, we have found like my colleagues and I found that uh, it, it does affect both physical and mental health uh, if you face discrimination um, in care. Um, in terms of crime and health, um, well, crime definitely has, so we public, I mean, people who work in uh, social science and public health, we view gun violence as a, principally as a public health hazard, because it's not only crime, but also like the highest rate of death, gun related death in the US is suicide. And suicide is possibly the most serious public health issue um, which is also obviously linked to mental health in the US. So crime can affect health in various ways. Uh, there's a long literature on how like mental health shock in early age or physical health shock in early age, including what we call in utero shock. Like even when the child is not born, when there is like a health shock, um, to the mother, uh, it, there have been studies from like from bombing in Vietnam to uh, like crime in Chicago. Uh, all sorts of studies have been there. So they show that the early early health shock has far-reaching consequences for both labor and health outcomes. Labor outcome because if you have this health shock and if you have if that translates into education stuff, like you cannot finish school, high school, or, or you have poor grades, that may affect, uh, at least in the US, that, that may affect your labor market outcome like wages, because if you cannot finish your education properly, you, you may not be able to find a good job. Um, I think a few people have their hands raised. I, I know that- Okay, uh, okay, let me well. take, uh, I can't really see, um, is it possible for you to moderate that? I, I, yeah, of I course. cannot see. Yeah, sure. Um, how, how about we have the people with their hands raised ask their questions in the chat? I know we're getting an influx of questions in the chat. So Professor D, it, you can it, just answer whichever ones in the chat that you- All right, uh, I think find. we want some spoken questions as well. So Agar, uh, Mr. Agarwal, if you want to take it away uh, with your question. Uh, I, sorry, I, I didn't understand. Um, uh, be, is, is someone um, going to ask, oh, sorry, uh, ask sorry, a verbal sorry. question? I... Um, I was wondering what uh, role do you think the internet plays into this? Because I've been seeing the internet more of an equalizing force with a lot of these issues. So, um, like for education, I, I, like... I'm sorry, but I have to duck that question because it, it's a it's a very big issue. So, I we if we have time in the in the end, I can talk about that. But some of the questions you were asking, like brain drain and in these are these are like very different from like what I'm talking today. So we have limited time, and I I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, any any like more specific question? Yeah, um, I can ask one question since yeah. I'm personally interested in a lot of like social determinants of health. So okay. I know that today you mentioned a lot about crime and education and um, kind of like access as uh, determinants of health. But out of all of the determinants of health, I know it changes quite a bit depending on who you are and what your research is. 
but your research and in your experience and in who you've talked to, uh, what kind of field do you feel is the greatest predictor of health in a community? I would say access. In my mm -hmm. research, um, health insurance, act, I mean, whether or not a person in the US, whether or not a person has health insurance kind of trumps a lot of other factors. And I think one of the, I personally, and I haven't seen research on this because it's still going on. I mean, I have seen uh, during the pandemic, uh, I think this is um, both testing and, and vaccination. The fact that they are largely, I mean, we have seen some reports on crazy bills, but by and large, both vaccination and, um, and testing have been free. Right, and I think that has played an enormous role in containing the role of in containing um, pandemic, uh, and the the success US has had in later stages also um, came from access to like testing and and later vaccination. So, so I, I to me this is really um, the the main important factor. Of, I mean, what we have found is that. Sometimes things like discrimination and stigma can can also have an independent effect controlling for access. Like even if two persons, two people have the same health insurance, if one is feeling uh, uneasy about going to see the doctor for, for not only race ethnicity, that is also something that I found in my research that um, things like uh, the second and most important factor in New York City was insurance status and after race and ethnicity. And when you think about it, if you're familiar with uh, US healthcare, you see that things like Medicaid, uh, if you have Medicaid, then that almost surely signals that you're also poor because Medicaid program is for poor people, like very poor people in the US. So when you are going to a doctor's office and show your Medicaid, I'm not surprised if, if you see, if you feel differently because, I mean, a lot of, lot of offices that flat out, they don't accept Medicaid students, uh, sorry, Medicaid uh, patients. But um, even if they do, I wouldn't be surprised if they're treated differently or if they, at least they feel they're discriminated against. So, so beyond health insurance, there are other factors too, but I would say having access to health insurance. And this, if, you, if you want to see uh, research, um, there's a long research on, Medicaid expansion as part of ACA. And I think by and large, you'll see that um, it has shown that when you give people health insurance, they use it and their outcomes improve, both preventive and uh, other outcomes. Okay, I, I think I have to, um, again, I'm digressing. So I have to get back to, let me get back to um, the station. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, so what, I mean, next we are going to do is uh, we'll try to learn from um, policy experiments. Uh, we, I just defined what public policy is. Uh, so best policies are evidence-based and some of the, so what follows would be drawn from like the original lecture uh, from Rachetti. And uh, he uses a couple of different types of policy experiments. I don't know how much uh, familiar um, everyone is with those methods, so I'll very try. I'll try to uh, describe them very quickly. So there are two broad pillars that Chetty talks about. One is moving to opportunity, which is providing affordable housing in high opportunity areas, and the second is place-based investment, increase upward mobility in low opportunity areas. Okay, so think about the context. Like the context was, you are potentially stuck in a low-income area. Okay, so two. There are two ways out. One, you move out of this low opportunity area to a high opportunity area or your family moves out or you stay there but there are opportunities new opportunities or or investment in your own areas okay so he talks about um this particular experiment moving to opportunity experiment which was implemented um in five sites and 4600 families were randomly assigned to one of the three groups one was one group was given housing vouchers which could be used only in low poverty areas. The second one was given same vouchers without any restrictions. They could go anywhere they want. And the third group was not um, given any voucher. Okay? Um, this is just a, the visual representation of just New York City, um, the three areas uh, 
in fact, if you remember, if, if you're not familiar with New York City, uh, so these are, so two of them are in the Bronx, which I kept repeating that the lower uh, income borrow of New York City. And the third one is uh, Harlem, which is which is not as poor. But, uh, uh, experiment. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with this, some of you may not be. Uh, again, you can teach like a whole course in experimental methods, um, but I'll try in two slides. <laughs> so I think the basic idea is, is the following. The basic idea is to get uh, to understand what, what is called, uh, what we call counterfactual. So suppose a person, you want to see, suppose you give tutoring service um, to, um, a, to a kid, okay, so to, uh, to a mentee. And you want to see that whether your tutoring service has improved the girl's um, SAT score. Okay. Now the problem is, ideally, you want to know what the girl's SAT score would be um, on the same day without tutoring service and with tutoring service, right? It's not possible because we have only one state of the world at a time. So you can either see the girl not take a not getting tutoring service, or you can see the girl taking a tutoring service. So this is the fundamental problem of causality that you cannot see two worlds at the same time. So what do we do? We, we kind of try to create this alternative world by what is called a randomized control trial or randomized experiment. So basically the idea is, suppose you find two girls who are otherwise very similar. They go to same school, they are same age, they come from the same um, economic background, uh, very similar um, high school uh, GPA. So then this two, you pick one by a coin flip and give her tutoring service and you don't give tutoring service to the other girl. So the second girl would be control group and the first girl would be treatment group. And then you compare and you see if, um, if the girl who got the tutoring service get what we call statistically significant higher um, score. Okay, if, if she does, then you say that, okay, your tutoring service has been effective. If she doesn't, you say that you reject the hypothesis that um, your tutoring service has been uh, effective. Okay, so the key here is the random selection. The random selection kind of tries to make sure that you do not like pre-select um, some people based on either high values or low values, okay? Now, so this, is, this was the, um, moving to opportunity experiments, so families were randomly selected from very similar backgrounds and they were given two, two different experiments, two different uh, what we call treatments, and then they, uh, then they were compared to the control group who didn't get anything. Okay? The army research um, found very little impact of moving to a better area on economic outcomes such as earnings. But what Jetty and Hendren did later, he, they tested for exposure effects among children. So they, they asked like, okay, for grown-ups and younger, um, like young adults, there was no effect, okay? And I think their hypothesis was they were already kind of set in their way, but they were curious to see if the younger children who got these new opportunities, whether they showed any improved uh, outcome. And so the one in purple is the key here. And I, I think this is this kind of research has made really Raj Chetty like a superstar in economics. But he, what he did was he didn't stop at like the data available to the researcher in the first round. So what he did was that he linked this young children's outcome, young children's income from their tax data years later, okay? So this is like very solid evidence that whether or not, I mean, solid way to get, sort of estimate the impact of this experiment, because when you have an individual's tax income data, that's a very, very accurate um, outcome of, accurate measure of their, of their outcome. So this, is, this was his innovation and doing that, he showed that, so the slides without, um, any shading, this one and the next one. Um, again, 
if you're not familiar with statistical methods, you cannot really make sense too much of uh, these p values. But let me just tell you uh, what it means. It, it means that for children below age 13, they showed significant improvement, which you can see uh, from the slides, improvement in earnings and college attendance and less desirable income, uh, sorry, uh, outcome like single mothers um, significantly, I mean, at a lower rate. Whereas for older adults, I don't think the shading is working here. So for older adults, uh, you don't see any um, effect. Okay. So, so what, um, let me go to, uh, okay, so no, okay, so I'll, I'll go uh, forward later. Let me try to take some questions at this point. All right, so I'm going to be moderating the questions again. Uh, so Lucas Yang, uh, if you have a question, okay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I think you just mentioned that the reason why um, the older group was unable to really adjust and improve outcomes in the future was because they were set in their ways as opposed to the younger children. Um, is In their research, was there a way to like forgo that and make it so that they can still be effective even if they're older? I, I don't think uh, um, I don't think that they have a very good satisfactory answer. I mean that is one of the critiques of randomized control trial that and this critique comes from social scientists like anthropologists uh, uh, and sociologists. So often in random sorry randomized control trial we look at this what we call average treatment effect. Like we look at the average group and like the average value and see the average value has increased or decreased, okay? Now, of course, within that, I mean, around that average value, you have significant amount of um, variation. So I, I don't think that um, researchers had a very satisfactory answer as to why the experiment failed. And oftentimes that is the case for many other uh, randomized experiments in social science that often we don't really know how, why, because there are so many moving parts in this kind of experiments that, um, that is, it's difficult to fathom. Uh, should I go to um, the chats or is there? Yeah, there's another question uh, by Mr. Mohamed Badran, if you want to take that away. And then we could go into the chat questions. Oh, sure. I think you are uh, muted. Okay, uh, I think we'll go on to Niha Soman. Um, okay, so I had a question about like the experiment in general. I know that the goal of like the moving to opportunities is to provide an affordable housing in high opportunity areas. But in general, aren't these higher opportunity areas more expensive to live in, like to provide these opportunities? So how would an experiment like this, like how would it attack that as well? Because just moving is obviously great, but living in the area and actually getting those opportunities is also probably harder, right? Excellent question. I don't have to answer it because it will be coming in a few slides. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm willing to take one more live question. All right, so Pranav. Yeah, so it was actually a question I had for one of your earlier slides um, about, you know, that graph that you were showing or like that visual that you were showing um, with the difference, or like the wealth inequality across just that river within New York City. And I was, mm -hmm. uh, the question I had was, um, why would you, from your research, uh, why would you say that there's such a major wealth divide across just one river? Like, would you say that there are any like, intrinsic characteristics to one side that originally brought like the wealth to there, like in the beginning? Oh, there's a long history of okay. like segregation and wealth inequality in, in New York City. Um, I, I think um, Manhattan has always been uh, like the center of attention for um, like both in terms of policy and everything else. Uh, Bronx, for instance, um, it, even if, so 
I mean, it starts from farther north you go. So for I, I may, some of you may have seen the movie in the Heights. So that Washington Heights is is farther above where Upper West Side. It's like 60 blocks above Central Park. So farther up you go, it gets, and you can see that in the map itself. I mean, it gets poorer and poorer. Um, so, and not only that, but also like they have like fewer metro, like subway lines and fewer other like opportunities. So people have to commute higher. Um, but at the same time, well, I, I saw a question on gentrification. Again, these are like really sort of very broad issues that I cannot really discuss so quickly. Uh, but it, it, I just would like to say that it's changing. Um, it, I mean, New York City's that kind of map might look very different 10 years from now. Uh, there, there are developments in South Bronx and Washington. I personally live like Northern Manhattan, so it's, it's changing rapidly now. The rents have gone up, um, prices have gone up. Uh, so it, it may, be, I mean, people may see what economists and finance call arbitrage opportunity, which is like buying low from one, one area and selling in other, high in the other area. So there may be some kind of spatial arbitrage uh, where people would move to like South Bronx and their, their income and rent will uh, go up. Uh, I'm not so hopeful about schooling system though. It's, it's still very, very segregated. Like one district, students from one district cannot go to school in other district, even if that's like 10 blocks away. So these, these lines have been historically drawn rather arbitrarily, and it's awfully difficult to change those lines because people who are inside the line, they fight very hard to protect their turf. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I see a few questions on like, um, like other experimental studies and all. I, my understanding is this is a basic economics course. So some of you may be very advanced, which is great, but I, I, I can't really take that kind of advanced questions um, about nitty gritties of this paper. My, my purpose is to like broadly describe the spatial inequalities and uh, its ramifications for policy, uh, not, not like either defend or attack Raj Chetty's work. Um, I, I should have cleared it up um, earlier. All right, let's, let's uh, move forward. Um, so some of the limitations of randomized experiment, I already mentioned uh, one. Um, there is attrition. There was one line which I skipped in the previous, one of the previous slides on compliance. So compliance is like the opposite of attrition. People who do not comply, uh, sometimes they just drop out. Um, not many people, even if you give an opportunity, and this is this is everywhere. If you think of like a school level intervention, even if you offer free tutoring service um, to a bunch of students, uh, not all of them will, will take it. Um, so, so basically, I, I want to skip, uh, we don't have too much time. I want to skip, so basically, um, again, what Chetty's, one of Chetty's contribution was to kind of take this experimental design and make it like a quasi-experimental method, which is you, you combine your experimental method, experimental evidence with administrative data, like tax record and um, SAT scores and stuff like that. I mean, in my research also, um, I've, we have done, uh, we did a survey in, in City College and then we combined survey on like students' attitude on, on uh, various services and whether they know the college premium, which is higher income of a college graduate. And then we combine those survey uh, evidence with administrative records like their previous high school GPAs and SAT scores and stuff like that. So I think this is, uh, this is what quasi-experimental method is. And I think it's very, very effective in social science when you can sort of leverage the best of both worlds. Okay. Um, again, this is like, you can read up uh, if you want. Again, these are like more of methodological uh, issue. Um, okay, so this is a slide I, I actually wanted to talk about, uh, implications for house, housing voucher policy. So, so basically to circle back to my discussion about public policy, so this is kind of we social scientists, particularly economists, we, we like to do in terms of our research, we 
try to gather as much scientific evidence um, with its admitted uh, shortcomings, as much scientific evidence as possible. And then we analyze that evidence and we try to understand the implications for future policy, okay? It's not a perfect science, it's not natural science. You can't say that, okay, just the way you, you push up you, in physics, you can say that, okay, if I hit the ball it, with this force, it will go that far with, given the friction. In economics, you can't tell that. You, you can't say that, okay, if I, if I give this person 16 years of um, high education, it's going to earn more than $100,000 for sure. It doesn't work that way, okay? So what lessons can we learn? We learned that housing vouchers can be very effective, but it must be targeted carefully. Vouchers should be targeted families. I shouldn't say should be. Um, again, these, these slides come from Jeffy's original. So again, I, I do not agree with all his slides, um, 100%. I think um, maybe the evidence suggests that if vouchers are targeted at families with young children, maybe they will be more effective. Again, thing with randomized control trial is um, one critique against RCT is called lack of external validity. Again, jargon alert. So external validity in plain English means that even if it works in Chicago, we can say for sure that it will work in New York City or Houston or Manila or Calcutta or any other big city in the world, okay? So that, that's the problem with randomized control trial. Often the results are very localized, okay? Um, okay, so this is uh, where the previous question, uh, I can answer the previous question. Why don't more low-income families move to opportunity? Okay, one simple explanation, areas that offer better opportunity may be unaffordable, okay? Even if you want to, you can. To test whether this is the case, examine the relationship between measures of upward mobility and rents. Uh, again, this is Jeffrey's slide. Um, so you can see like a broad um, upward sloping line showing a uh, positive correlation between these two uh, factors. But what is interesting is that you can still sort of find a deal, okay, in the sense that um, in Seattle, in, the, in a place like Central District, um, with where a lot of um, families with housing vouchers currently live, it has poor outcomes. Whereas a neighborhood called Normandy Park is less expensive, but produces dramatically better outcomes uh, for children. Okay, I'm not very familiar with Seattle, but from my New York City experience, I can tell you that this can be uh, various factors. Like for instance, uh, it can be a function of like a couple of very good charter schools, for instance, uh, which attract uh, good students. It could be um, a factor of like a big institution like a university, which attracts certain amount, certain uh, kind of demographic and families. Um, but by and large, I think the point is well taken that families may not be able to move to higher opportunity areas simply because they cannot afford to. And also just because um, you move to an area doesn't necessarily mean that uh, all your outcomes will be better. Okay. Uh, these concerns are concerns on this slide. They are more like policy concern. One is obviously cost. Okay, uh, is the voucher program too expensive to scale up? So scaling up is also another critique against randomized control trial. Uh, it's kind of similar to external validity that, uh, okay, I know that, okay, if I give 10, 10 teachers to uh, school, the school will, uh, the school children will um, have higher grades, okay? But can you put, can you allocate 10 more teachers to every school? You can't, right? So what's the value of, of that kind of um, policy wisdom? Um, and then there are issues of negative spillovers. Um, integration may hurt i wouldn't like to say rich but but i mean putting uh like i wouldn't say forcefully but incentivizing a set of families to move to an area without consulting the current residents may have um poor consequences so i mentioned how in New York City, certain areas, certain districts, and those families and parents forcefully um, protect their turf 
for the same reason. They they are afraid that other families would move into their areas and sort of dilute the quality of their schools. So this is um, again this is the problem in social science. You you cannot really have you cannot control all the all the uh, moving parts in an experiment. Um, also the moving everyone from one neighborhood to another is is unlikely to have significant effect and and basically you you what we call general equilibrium you you can't really economy wide you can't really move families around right so then who will live in in the previously low opportunity areas so all these things are like tells you that it's not a magic bullet, okay? Even if you find in your research that, okay, if you move some families to um, high opportunity areas, some of them say with young children, they show better outcome. You, you just can't keep doing that throughout the country. Okay, so this is the last batch of questions, maybe two or three. Um, is there a yeah, so, question? Yes, there is. Um, I believe... Okay. Um, Sagarika, uh, I think she has a question, okay. and then we'll move on to John Dachi right after. Okay. Um, if Mohammed Bagyan wants to take his question on, I know that he's not raising his hand right now, but he requested to ask questions. Uh, you can ask right after if possible, but we'll go in that order. Right. Um, so thank you, first of all, for your insights so much. My question was about the negative spillovers that you mentioned about um, people moving to opportunity or moving to an area with better economic opportunities and typically studied outcomes. So the sort of blockbusting as someone mentioned in the, uh, in the chat box or this sort of uh, community protection against outsiders or lower income people entering, would it typically be seen as a result of um, xenophobia in the purest sense of the word, just, you know, uh, an aversion to strangers, or could it also be um, looked at differently when it comes um, in areas with different levels of diversity, homogeneous or heterogeneous populations, or um, linguistic uh, commonalities, things like that? Yeah, I mean, all these factors play a role. Um, well, the most bland economist answer would be Basically, everyone, every family maximizes their own welfare. Okay, so in that maximization scheme, if um, so, this would be like kind of the Chicago school explanation of this, which is purely sort of economics and no other emotion or social science um, uh, factor. So, even if we ignore all the like race and language and all these factors even if just one set of very otherwise very identically demographic group moving into a, a new neighborhood, I might just be worried about overcrowding in my school, in my uh, kid's school. Okay, so I don't, I may not even care about all those um, factors that you mentioned, but even if you strip away all those important factors, just because it, it may be overcrowded, my uh, kids' school, um, I, I may stop. want to stop that. So basically every individual tries, every family tries to maximize their own welfare and whatever lowers that welfare, they are going to uh, try their best to stop it. Um, in, in terms of policy, I, I think sometimes if you, if you place like families in a larger neighborhood where they are not going to make any significant uh, difference, then probably there'll be less resistance. Um, I mean, there's this whole literature in, in history and literature in the US about busing students from one part of the town to the other, and, and this is not new. Um, but, excuse me, um, I, I think one, the thing with voucher is that the government is not explicitly sort of passing people to another neighborhood, right? It, it is incentivizing a certain group of people to potentially move to another place. So they may or may not move. Um, as we saw, only half of them actually use the voucher in, in one case. So, But to answer your question, it, it may not be one of those uh, factors. It could be just like 
simple overcrowding or anything that affects uh, the current family's welfare, they're going to uh, try to stop it. Uh, second question. Okay. So uh, you had mentioned that, you know, a lot of the, the a, a great deal of uh, uh, people who were young were able to sort of have greater social mobility when moving and using the vouchers. Uh, would this, uh, I know that the, this is at least one part is, you know, and perhaps the most significant is that they have access to greater opportunities and um, so that they're able to take more opportunities when they're younger. And so, especially in school, you know, with regards to uh, internships, jobs, et cetera. Uh, do you think that, you know, also things like um, uh, having less crime in the area, improvement of health, access to health care and things like that, you know, having an effect on their mental health and their well-being would also allow them to, um, you know, take better, uh, take a better advantage, uh, take better advantage of their opp uh, the opportunities that they're given and put more effort into, this, let's say, schoolwork or work in general, which would then allow them to also, you know, uh, improve their standing better as opposed to people who are older and with the uh, generally have less, uh, you know, this type of environment would have less, uh, less sort of effect on them rather than somebody who was younger. Would that have like a, um, a significant I'll, effect? I'll get to your question in one slide, okay? So let me pull up the next slide. I see some discussion on the chat about New York City school system. I don't want to get into that too much because I know we have a very diverse group of uh, students from all over the world. So many of them do not know what is SHSAT at all. Um, I, I have two kids in the system, so I know about those things. Um, and I, I work like it's funny because sometimes I wear my parental hat and I think about issues one way. And sometimes I put on my social scientist hat and then I think about the same issues in different way. So which also it's true for like many parents that I mean, they, they sometimes they have to do what is best for their kids, even if it's kind of not aligned with their political view. Um, but just a quick thing for everyone. So New York City had some ex uh, sort of this experiment this year because of the pandemic. So some of the schools which required um, test, they couldn't conduct those tests. So they did just a lottery. So this will be like putting um, like an international lot, doing an international lottery for Harvard and Princeton and entering students instead of any other credential, just people who are lucky to get into Harvard. So that will be a giant social experiment, which we'll, I'm sure we'll analyze later. And the second is some of the district requirements were also removed this year, which is also an experiment, which is like earlier, if you lived in a low income district, we could not go to a school in a high dis income district. But this year, DOE, the Department of Education has removed some of those uh, restrictions. So again, that, that's kind of a social experiment. It is even better because this is like, this is not done by either Raj Chetty or federal government. It is it is kind of done by prompted by the pandemic, which no one saw coming. So these are all relevant issues. But again, I don't want to delve uh, deal too much um, into them because uh, of like the student demographic here. Um, okay, so I, I know we can't do a re real quiz now, but. Um, and I'm really surprised that this never showed up in Rajchetty slides. What is perhaps the most common strategy to moving to opportunity? Anyone for the humankind, for the human history? You guys can call it out if you have the answer. Uh, you can you can put it in the chat. Again. Should the answer be of our own opinion or should it be the concrete one? Own own opinion, yeah. Absolutely. Migration, okay? So migration is how individuals over the years have moved to better opportunities. I mean, I, I grew up in a poor, poorer country and I moved to, well, I, I moved to US for my higher education, which is basically higher opportunity. Um, and so, so basically now to get back to the uh, question that was asked uh, just before I, I showed this slide, um, whether younger, um, like whether it's better to sort of migrate at a young age than older age, I think so. I mean, there is whenever we do research on like say linking health outcomes to uh, various factors, and we take in um, immigration, like whether or not someone has been born in this country, um, we whenever data allows, we also control for how long the person has been in the country. For 
For health, however, just so you know, uh, there is something called an immigration paradox. So for health, um, newer immigrants actually have show higher, better health outcomes than people who have immigrated uh, longer ago, because mostly because they, they adopt, like myself included, when I, I got like free, not free, but like cheap, like Coca-Cola and cheese and chocolates when I came to this country, I gained like 10 pounds. So uh, actually people who have lived in the US uh, longer sometimes show worse um, health outcomes, whereas the newer immigrants show better outcomes. So the point is, it definitely is an important factor, um, the age at which you are moving to a new opportunity, a new area, but it can go either way, depending on what you are looking at. All right. Um, the second, uh, well, uh, I think I'm doing more or less well on time. I'll probably spill over for like five minutes. Um, the second point that uh, Chetty mentioned was uh, place-based investment, increased upward mobility in low opportunity areas. Um, this is this is from their slides. I do not agree uh, with many of uh, those narratives, uh, like stable family structure. I don't even know what stable family structure means. Um, Barack Obama was uh, raised by a single mom. There are many families. There, there are many successful people um, who who were raised by uh, single parents and not necessarily from like stable family structure. This is probably one of those cases where you see this behavior in on like average. Uh, I just wanted to put it up because like uh, the slide was already there. Uh, I, I, I agree more with better quality schools and greater social capital. Social capital is kind of the social interaction that I mentioned earlier. That your, how much capital you have not only depends on what you have, but also what your friends have. Okay, so if you're hanging out with friends who are also sort of motivated, um, they do their work, they go to school regularly. Um, so you may have like, they, you may have um, imbibed some of your friends uh, capital also. Okay. There's also one area where research is still ongoing, including Chetty's team. There is no magic solution, um, like what exactly requires to be done to pull uh, a particular area out of poverty. The same is true for at the international level. Um, what development economics study is, is basically this question, like how you can pull poor countries out of poverty. And one of the Nobel laureate economists, Robert Lucas, he wants in his Nobel lecture, he mentioned that once you start thinking about this issue, you stop thinking about everything else. So this is really one of those uh, puzzles that social scientists haven't solved yet. However, um, uh, well, this is what their research agenda is, which is not mine, so I'll skip that. So I'll finish with one, um, I think what is what has been a pretty successful um, social education experiment, which is the CUNY experiment. I mean, I'm part of CUNY system. Uh, the quote is from, so again, um, CUNY owes to Raj Chetty and his team because they did this research. So they basically, what they did was they, they looked at uh, students who entered CUNY 30 years ago, and then they looked at their um, income 30 years later. And then they basically, they saw the income strata the students belonged to when they started CUNY and the income group they belong to 30 years later, okay? So the definition of social mobility is you start, if you start from like the, say the bottom 20% and you end up in like the 50% or 50% or 60%, that's basically the definition of social mobility, okay? And several CUNY colleges, um, this is a quote from an article in New York Times, 76% so of the students who enrolled in late 1990s came from families in the bottom fifth of their income distribution and they ended up in the top three fifths of the distribution. Okay? So these students entered college poor and they left on their way, left their way um, on their way to middle class and often upper middle class. So this is a much more concrete um, visual um, illustration of, of that phenomenon. Um, I think the graph is fairly self-explanatory. You can, you can see um, social mobility happening 
um, in this graph. So I think that I think investment in public education. This is my own opinion as a social scientist. Investment in public education and public health. These two are, I think, almost unfailable strategy. Uh, free preschool, free community colleges, and also vocational schools, and at least subsidize higher education. Uh, because we economists also um, talk about an idea. Some of you are clearly advanced students, so you already know um, what we call uh, positive and negative externality. So positive externality is when you invest a dollar in, in an enterprise, the return to you may be a dollar fifty cents, but the return to the society may be five dollars. Okay, and so education and health are two areas where an investment in one dollar typically has multiple dollar return. So even if you might think that, okay, free school is expensive, the taxes may go up, so on and so forth, Call, I mean, uh, colleges, um, subsidized uh, four-year college or free community college would like create a tax burden uh, for the society. These things typically have much higher return than the initial tax dollar. And large scale investment in public edu education have potential to lift a lot of students and families out of their the, the trap that we began our discussion that you, you need something to help people get out of this trap because unless something, some public policy initiative is taken left to the market, typically a lot of people would languish unfortunately in the trap they found themselves into. And this creates this enormous spatial inequality that your future can be determined by like the country you're born, city you're born, or even the zip code you're born. Okay? So that's, I think that that's basically the main theme 